Okay, now, step one. Point your flashlight out into the yard. And get your camera. Are you recording? Recording. Now, on three, go. Whoa! One, two, three. Whoa. <laughs> Not. Ooh. Whoa! <laughs> like that, dude. <laughs> Ooh. Whoa! Whoa! Oh my gosh! That is so amazing! Look at all of that light! Okay, if that right there is how you're currently shooting beam shots, then I have some good news for you. You've already got the most important thing that you need, and it's not the flashlight. I'm going to show you how to take that passion and go from this... Oh! Oh my gosh! ...to this. Oh, no way! <laughs> One thing that you are going to need so we can jump into this, you'll find right in your kitchen. Grab that box of salt and pour some into your hand because I want you to take everything I say with at least one grain. I'm fully aware that my videos are not professional quality. I'm not under that delusion and I don't want you to be either. But Peter McKinnon doesn't make flashlight videos, so we got to do our best to help each other out. Okay, tip number one is choosing your spot. You want to pick a spot that does the best possible job of showing depth. And I don't necessarily mean you have to be far away from something, but you need to make sure that you're shining your light at something. You don't want a lot of empty sky in your background. And I realize that not everyone lives in the 100 acre woods in a place where it's ideal for taking beam shots, but your options might be better than what you think. For example, this is the view that I have out my front door. We've got a wide open space and we've got a few rolling hills here and a couple of trees out there. And then we've also got uh, further back that second set of hills that's way out there. So we've got good distance here. But this is a horrible place to take beam shots. All of the landscape lines are running in a horizontal direction across the frame and there's really nothing to shine at. There's all this wide open sky up there and just not, it's just not that good of a place. Now here we've got a little better, we've got more to look at, we've got some trees to bounce off of and a few size reference objects. Um, it's, this isn't terrible, I do shoot from here once in a while just to change things up. But watch what happens if we go from here and all we do is turn around and shoot from the exact opposite direction. Uh, you've probably all seen this shot in my videos. We've got plenty of range here. We've got a nice framework of trees all along this edge and over here. And we have our leading lines that come from here down the frame and here at kind of an angle instead of just across the frame like this. We've got a few structures for some side reference and the best part is in every direction we've got something for the light to splash off of. Even out here at the very top we've got kind of a minimal amount of black sky space. This gives us something in every direction to shine the light at. This is also the place where you've seen me do my little speed walk to show some additional depth in the shot, which brings us to tip number two. Get in front of the camera. Doing first person shots is a good way to show some perspective, and I really like those too, but it doesn't hurt to set the camera on a tripod and get out there and move around. This is gonna give your viewers a richer perspective on what it actually feels like to have this light in your hand. My third tip on choosing your spot is this, get out of the darkness. People tend to think that pitch black is what you're looking for, and that's really not the case. Obviously, you don't want a street lined with a bunch of thousand watt lamps, but you also don't want complete darkness either. 
introducing some ambient light into your shot is one of the best things that you can do for your video. Here's the shot of my yard in pitch black. And now here it is with some additional light introduced. It not only gives us uh, a better perspective on the environment, it's going to help reduce the noise or that grainy look that you get in your footage. One of the hardest things about getting an accurate representation in beam shots is that the camera always tends to blow out the hot spot and dumb down the spill, and that's not what it looks like at all in real life. Adding some ambient light to the shot is going to help you with that. I I don't know exactly how to say this correctly, but basically what it does is reduces the range of lights and darks that the camera needs to capture in the image, and so it just kind of takes some of the workload off of your camera. If I'm in a place where there's really not any other lights, I'll even bring my own. Sometimes I'll use other flashlights or little portable lights that are battery operated that I have. Um, in the shot that I showed you earlier where it was my two porch lights, there was actually a third light in use right there. Off on uh, the one side, I also used a small box light like this. You really can't even hardly see it in the shot, but bringing that extra light in is still really helpful in getting a crisp image. With enough of it, you can actually bring the ISO down on your camera, which is really what starts to clear up the image. Okay, moving on to equipment. This is the part of the video where I'm supposed to tell you, equipment doesn't matter. You can do this with anything. And that's really just not true. At least not for this. I shoot my beam shots on a Canon 5D2, which is a full-frame sensor camera in 2018 is worth, they go for probably six to nine hundred dollars. Plus, uh, the lens that I have currently, I have one that's about a hundred and one that's about four hundred that I use for shooting the shots. Now, I totally get that most people cannot spend that kind of money to make beam shots and so what we're going to do now is I went and bought the cheapest possible DSLR that I thought might potentially have the capability to shoot some decent beam shots and it's the Canon T5i. Now I paid $366 for this camera on eBay which I realize is still a lot of money. Now I wanted this little flip out screen so if you can use your phone for vlogging and just want a dedicated beam shots type camera for about $100 less than that you can get the T5S. One other thing you need to realize for in that budget is that you will need an additional lens. This kit lens that comes with this or even on nicer cameras, you're not going to shoot beam shots with that. They're too noisy. The, the, the image, you just won't be happy with the image quality. So I recommend buying a prime lens. What you want to get is one that's as wide as possible and as fast as possible. Ideally, what you would want is something that's f1.4 capable for the aperture, but those are, they're expensive. You can save a lot of money if you just jump back to f1.8 and I've had pretty good results with that. Uh, you, do, you don't want 2.8 or 3.5, those are just not going to do it. On my full frame camera I got away with using a 50 millimeter lens for a long time because it was like a hundred bucks. Uh, on this camera, on the ASPC size sensor, you don't want that. It's, it's just too narrow. Your shots are going to be like looking through this little hole. Uh, the closest thing I could find that was fairly wide and fairly fast and fairly cheap was this lens for $89. For this video, I'm just going to use the f1.8 lenses that I already have. Now, I know a lot of you probably want to film on your smartphone, so we're going to do a comparison between the T5i and about a $400 smartphone. John's phone is the uh, Moto Z2 Play, which is what you saw the shots earlier on. For the settings on our camera, what I recommend is to set the shutter speed uh, down to about 1 30th of a second because that's going to allow more light in. Aperture as wide as you can go, f1.8 in our case. 
and then once we get outside, I usually adjust the ISO up or down from there with a powerhouse flashlight like the Ace Beam X45 and this camera, I'm thinking uh, probably around 3200. If we're lucky, we might be able to get away with 1600. One last thing I've found that really helps with this is to go into the camera settings and create a picture profile specifically for beam shots. I like to bring down the contrast a few notches and then bump up the sharpness just a little. Beam shots are extremely high contrast, so doing this is going to allow the camera to show spill and the surrounding area a little better, I think. Okay, first up is the footage John shot on his Moto Z2 Play. Using the techniques we learned in this video, he captured what I thought was a pretty decent image. It was fairly stable too, considering he didn't have a tripod. Now, here's a look at the footage from our T5i using my 20mm f1.8 lens. Honestly, I was expecting the T5i to destroy the Z2 Play in this footage, but looking at both of them, I don't see that much of a difference. The T5i footage is brighter because we have the significant advantage of full manual settings, but as far as clarity, sharpness, graininess in the image, I don't see much of a difference. I'd like to hear from you guys in the comments. What do you think looks better? Now, the title of the video does say how I shoot beam shots, so we are going to take a look at some footage shot on my 5D2. Look at the level of detail in the trees, in the grass, in the equipment in the shed. The first time I saw the footage from this camera, I was ruined. It was like stepping up from a plastic Walmart flashlight to my first hot wire. A Mag 74, by the way. This camera captures amazing footage that's clear and sharp, and it's a good low light performer. Recently, I was watching YouTuber Flashaholics channel. And I saw what I thought were some pretty good beam shots there using a combination of some of the better spots he could find and ambient lighting. He did a great job of showing what his Emulent DX80 was capable of. I like these shots because they not only show the power of the light, they really convey the way it feels to have it in your hand. For more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Good lucks.